Jackson are we talking about? Andrew. Andrew. Right, Andrew Jackson. Now, start count. The 1824 election, you remember the corrupt bargain? Was Andrew Jackson happy about that? No. No. He spent the next four years campaigning. Um, and when I say campaigning, he was the first president to go out and actively campaign. Before this time, you had more people go and they campaigned for you. All right, Jackson went and he, he did a lot more of this campaigning and he was active with it. Um, so by the time we get to, to 1828, he's been campaigning for four years. The qualifications for voters, remember that universal mail suffrage that, that we have. Um, a lot of those things had come about and there was a lot less property requirements. Notice I have on there the three times the number of voters in 1828 as in 24, which the common man really liked Andrew Jackson. Andrew Jackson is a very rich guy, but he wasn't born rich and he hated the rich people. He didn't like those blue bloods, those people that, well, they're rich because mommy and daddy were rich. He earned his money himself. Um, he is a, I mean, he's a type of guy that is willing to go out and fight. He has a couple lead balls sitting in his body because during his lifetime he was in over 100 duels. Um, even when he was young during the Revolutionary War, he was told by a British officer to shine the British officer's shoe, and, the sh and they wouldn't, and the officer, he actually had scars on his back where the officer, the British officer, had sliced him with a sword. Okay, because he refused to go and do something like that for a British officer. So he's kind of that pioneer spirit um, for us Americans. We are ones, we are stubborn as Americans. We don't like to be told what to do. Um, and he kind of represents more of that, that spirit. He is a Westerner. Uh, but in that election, he defeats the incumbent President John Quincy Adams. If you look at this map, you'd think he won pretty big. So we have a sitting president for the most part in 1828. Things were going pretty good for our country. But that kind of tells you about what Andrew Jackson and, and where his popularity was um, that they had. And John Quincy Adams, we kind of look at things. He's kind of a, I mean, he's one of our great leaders, but happened to be at the wrong time period. Um, what did Jackson want to do? Well, I guess personally, why, like, why did he want to be one so bad? Well, Jackson's main thing was the first time for the president is that whole corrupt bargain. It just made him mad. Yeah, it made him mad. And you don't make Jackson mad. Okay, it's just don't tick him off. Okay, I mean, and, and he concentrated his effort on that. Did he really like politics? No, it wasn't that. But was hey, he was one that he he lost, and he lost because he felt like again there had been this deal made against him. Uh, meanwhile, John Quincy Adams, one thing that's kind of unique about him is even though he lost this presidency, he would go back and serve in the House of Representatives for almost three decades. Uh, and some of you, if you, I don't know if you end up taking this tour, but depending on um, if you, if this some, some of you I know took a safety patrol trip, but if you've ever been in the, the old Congress, they had an area that you, that you could go. And John Quincy Adams used to lay his head down and act like he was sleeping. But, but there is a part, if you are sitting in the old house room, that if you speak, because of the way that the dome is, it reflects off of it and the sound will come down. And that one part of the room, you can hear other conversations. So he would sit there and be able to eavesdrop on people on the other side of the room, but he would act like he was sleeping. And people would wonder, how the heck does he know what's going on? All right, but that's where, but that's where for John Quincy Adams, he kind of served after that would also end up being one of our leading people against slavery in the future as a representative of former president. But, um, what what uh, state was he in? Massachusetts. All right, a new party. This is where we have the first party system where we would have the Democratic Republicans and Federalists. Now we have the second party system. In 1828, the Democratic Republicans split up. We will have John Quincy Adams and they will start calling themselves the National Republicans. Meanwhile, Jackson is one for the people, more Democratic, and that is where they drop the Republican side. This is also where the donkey comes about, because the donkey, someone had written that Jackson is as stubborn as a jackass, and he liked that idea, so the symbol of the donkey then becomes for the Democrats, the same thing we have today. Meanwhile, the National Republicans, they were they would eventually become the Whig Party. Now, even though John Quincy Adams is the person running for that, 
in the long run, run the, the Whig Party would be the ideas of Henry Clay. It is a very, very weird coalition of people. You have rich plantation owners in the South that are in the same coalition with abolitionists in the North that want to ban slavery. The one thing that the Whig Party will have that kind of puts them together is they are against Andrew Jackson. <laughs> and that is really the, the whole thing that we'd have for, for a Whig Party. You can kind of say that we, we have sort of the same thing happening today when it comes down to, even though it's not a true party, but a section of the Republican Party for the Tea Party. The Tea Party has ultimately emerged for various reasons as a party that's just against Barack Obama. Okay, I mean, it's, you, have, you have some people that are, are former more libertarian ideas there and uh, with it that are, are in it along with, with, with people that, that were saying that we shouldn't be involved in foreign affairs. All right, it's a whole group of, of different people, but that's where at that time they were just against Andrew Jackson. Little drama. Some of you like drama. Well, here's your drama. The first part of the drama... The first part of the drama actually occurs before the actual presidency. And it goes with Andrew Jackson. Andrew Jackson um, married a woman that was already married. Okay. Isn't that legal? No, it's illegal. Now, the thing was, is that it's illegal. She didn't know that she was legally still married. Uh, to make a long story oh. short, his wife, um, Rachel Jackson, had gone, has thought she had a divorce, but the paperwork never went through. So legally, she was not divorced. He married her, thinking she was divorced. They found out later on that, oops, no, you weren't. So basically, completed the paperwork, she got divorced, and then he's legally married to her. So I mean, it wasn't like he went out and married another man's wife. Okay, uh, over there. It was basically talking about, it, um, it, it, was not, it was nothing more than just paperwork type finance. But they constantly hounded him. When I say they, there's basically Clay supporters hounded Jackson and his wife and basically, oh, you, you married this, and this is a woman that was married to two men. And she ended up passing away around the same time that he won the election. Oh. Uh, so the inauguration for him was kind of bittersweet. Yes, he won, but now he lost his wife. So Did he, he and his wife because of like that. Well, he blamed it on the fact that these people that basically went and drug her name out in the public. All right. So he basically is blaming it on the get those people. Alright, and so that's why he is upset. Do we want to take off Andrew Jackson? No. So, so, some of those rioters and people that went against this. Well, once he got into office, we have this lady by the name of Peggy Eaton. It is the wife of the Secretary of State. A lot of the other women in the, cab the cabinet wives did not like her, would not accept her socially. See, her family had a boarding house. Now, those of you that don't know what a boarding house is, it's basically like a hotel. But some boarding houses are, it's, it's kind of like motels today. You can have motels that are legitimate motels that people have. You have other hotels in some parts of the city that rent rooms by the hour. Oh. Okay. Okay. Well, that's the way some boarding houses were. Okay. If you understand what I'm saying. The Eaton Boarding House, for everything we know in Washington, D.C., there it was not a house of ill repute or anything like that, like some boarding houses. Uh, but this is where these other women didn't want anything to do. She was not a stand. Well, Jackson did not like the idea of this. And this is where I have on here that Jackson's wife's death plays into Philip. He kind of felt sorry for Peggy Eaton. Plus, remember, Jackson, even though he's rich, does he like those old rich families? No. They're a bunch of snobs. And he, he was trying to force, now, trying to force a bunch of women to accept another woman. <laughs> Is that going to work? And he, you tell your cabinet members, hey, they've got to invite her to the parties. All right, and these guys go home to their wives and say, hey, you gotta be nice to Peggy Eaton. What are those wives gonna say? Nope. So this is where it ended up with this, it truly is drama that ends up happening. What ultimately happens with Jackson is a lot of his cabinet members design or resign, and the main one that would resign was his own vice president, John C. Calhoun. Recognize that name? Yeah. Okay, John C. Calhoun, who is vice president, now he resigns over 
this issue of basically a fight among a bunch of women. Uh, but this is where, and this, again, Jackson is kind of standing up for the common person. All right, now, his cabinet that he had, he didn't really like them. He had to kind of choose them with the party. So he had what was nicknamed the kitchen cabinet. Any guess of where they met? Yeah, in the kitchen. That's why they got the nickname. They weren't officially in the cabinet, but they were his advisors. They're more of his down to earth, his friends, the people that he trusts. And he, and that's who he gets his advice from. Yeah, he might have somebody else as a secretary of war, another person as secretary of treasury. But when it came down to true advice, he listened to the kitchen cabinet. Uh, and that's what. Some, and we'll see this happen a couple of times in history that you have people that they they have unofficial advisors, and Jackson was one that that really happened. All right, there is a saying, to the victor go the spoils. What does that mean? You win, okay, you get the, the benefits of this. We had a system which was called the spoils system. And in the spoils system, if you won, you get to appoint people in all kinds of government jobs. Today, we don't have very much besides the cabinet ambassadors that a president can appoint. But in those days, it could be as low as the postmaster in a little town somewhere in the United States. Can you? Postmaster, now you basically work up your rankings through. through. But it could be. Here you, let's say you work for, you're the postmaster of Inverness for 20 something years, but it turns out that you didn't vote for the right person for president and didn't campaign for that person. You lose your job and somebody that did it. Was they weren't secret ballots, all secret ballots everywhere. Plus, yeah. and this is where we, we still have some of this that kind of goes on in the school system. All right, it's, it's even though if you are working in the school board, all right, it's supposed to be non-political. Well, there are some positions that the superintendent can hire and fire. It's always funny to see a year after an election what principals and vice principals end up getting switched around, losing their jobs the year after superintendent's election. Okay. Um, it's all to make the schools better. Do you think that there might have to be something personal that it's there? Mm -hmm. all right. I always talk, find, kind of find it funny when you go and look and see because anybody that contributes to the campaigns, all right, you can go and see who contributes to the campaigns for various school board members and for the superintendents. And then you can, and sometimes you can kind of look and see what happens in the next two years after that, that happens. But that is where the spoil system was. It had been done before. Jackson came in even bigger with it. Um, and this would, throughout the 1800s, it would get worse and worse. Now, here's where you have both sides. The critics said it made corruption. All right, people are going to go and they're going to, they're going to purposely campaign for somebody so they can get them an easy job. If I campaign for this person, I can get myself a nice, easy job in the county office. I don't really have to work that hard. They give me a nice little title, and, and then I've got it made, made pretty easy. Now, defenders of the system, and this is where Jackson had it, said that it, you made it where you rotated things. And Jackson actually lived up to this, even though he did the spoil system. Even when he won the election in 1832, and he won re-election, he would switch over people even if you supported them. Because he said, we need to switch this over. And this is where this idea of democracy comes in for Jackson. And you'll see this theme, the common person. Should it matter who is working such and such jobs in the government? And Jackson's, Jackson's point of view was, we take this person, you're out of it, this person in. We need to make it where we rotate things around. Not, well, you've had this job for 20 years, you go ahead and keep it just because you've had it. Now, again, defenders will say, well, if you're doing such a good job, why should you get removed if the person's doing the right job? But that's where there was this rotation. Now, a side effect, and this is where we're going to see later in history, is people were very loyal to the party. I better make sure I go for Republicans or Democrats, or in this case it would be the Whigs, um, in there so that I can keep my job. Um, all right, Jackson is known sometimes as King Andrew or King Jackson. His first the nickname that he's usually known as is Old Hickory. And those of you that know Hickory, it's wood, it's tough. Uh, but he would be seen as a protector of the, for the common man against the rich and privileged. That's why the common person loved him. When he was inaugurated, we had thousands of people come to Washington, D.C. 
because we went from these rich Virginia dynasty and Adams, okay, we went from these rich guys to a common person. And they actually had to go out and have cider and whiskey out on the on the lawn of the, the White House. And people people then said wanted a souvenir. So they were at they, they came to the inauguration, so hey, they want a souvenir, they went in and took some pieces of China and silverware with them. Take it home. I mean you you supported Jackson. Should you get something for that? And so and then people in Washington DC were like, oh my gosh, we now have the mob that has taken over uh, there. And, and uh, but Again, Jackson was seen as someone for the common person, against the rich one. Uh, he followed Jefferson's ideas. We should spend less in the government. Jefferson said small government. What happened to the government during Jefferson's presidency? You like that? Yeah, it grew. Guess what will happen when Jackson comes and is making the government smaller? Guess what happens? It ends up growing. We kind of have the same thing happen with George W. Bush. He comes to office saying we're going to cut government. And it grows. Uh, when you're in power, people hate to get rid of it. But Jackson would go. One of the things that he would do is he would use the veto. If he didn't like something, if all that was coming through, he was not afraid to use his veto. Had been used very little um, in there. He actually used it more than I said than any president before. He used it more than the six presidents before him combined together by using it 12 times. Did he actually read them anymore? Well, he knew what they were. And it would be something like, we're going to have one that will be for the Bank of the United States. All right, it, it, no matter what, how it was worded, he was going to veto it. All right, the last part that we're going to do here for today will be with the, about the Indians. During the 1920s, late 20s, and the 19, early 1820s and 1830s, we will have a series of laws that are to remove the Indians west to Indian territory. Now, what state today is Indian territory? Yeah, Oklahoma. Okay, but at that time, it was land that we set aside. Now, on paper, this sounds really nice. We've been having conflicts with the Indians, so to make sure that we can kind of do it, and this is where, like, you, sometimes you'll see some little cartoons with Andrew Jackson, like he is a father taking care of the Indians. But we're going to take them out of their lands here, and we're going to give them great land out west. Um, not to make fun of Oklahoma, but how many of you have been through Oklahoma? There are some there are some beautiful areas of Oklahoma. There's a lot of Oklahoma that, well, it's not so beautiful. And if you're if you are someone that's been farming and having a pretty good life in North Carolina, Tennessee, Georgia, and you are stuck in Oklahoma, you probably didn't get as good of land as what you have. Plus, we promised them we're going to give you livestock. We're going to give you stuff for your farming. Of course, when they got there, did we fill our promise to them? So we basically take We paid them for their land and gave them new land, but we really didn't fill our promise with this. But this is where the Indian Removal Acts were. Now, what do you mean not like it is? And this, well, a lot of people did. This is where this case kind of shows this. The case comes up, Worcester versus Georgia. Now, to make it where this is John Marshall, probably his last signature case that he'll have. Yes, 1832, he's still around. And he comes, he comes up justice in 1801. He's been around for three decades. But his court would rule, this is unconstitutional. You can't move these people out west. Andrew Jackson, I even wrote on there with response. Marshall has made his decision. Let him enforce it. Now, oh. Should, okay, I have that in there. But it should, should say, let him enforce it. Or let, let him enforce it. So now it. let him enforce it. Yeah, now let him. Thank you. <laughs> now let him enforce it. So I got to correct that. But, that's a question for the people. Did they side with John Marshall and the Supreme Court that said this is wrong for what you're doing to Native Americans? Teachers, please pardon the interruption. This is the last call for the flu shots in the conference room. Thank you. So this is where this is the people they sided with Jackson. Which, for a common people, guess who gets the land in Tennessee, Georgia, North Carolina, that the Indians are given. And so this is where, for, for Jackson, he was able to keep a lot of that, that support. So they sided with Jackson. Right. And this is where, for a president, they can deny it. 
Um, one of the cases is where the Supreme Court meets this, is starting to meet this week. One of the cases that will be heard during this session, which we won't know or until at the end, is the Defense Marriage Act. Um, and some of this kind of goes with some of the things for the don't ask, don't tell, and those type of things that we have um, in the military. And President Obama said that if it is overturned, that he will, he will not enforce it himself. There. So that's one of the things the president has. Now, if you have enough people that are against that, the people can overrule. But if people support the president, in this case, Jackson, who did remove him. All right, we have the five civilized tribes. I have on there why name that. Let's go to the question, the okay. back question first. Why were these tribes that were all in the southeast of the United States, why are they named the five civilized tribes? They agreed to They well, some could read and write. They had language. They fought, well, they fought with us. With during during um, the War of 1812, one of these tribes would be the Creek Indians. Andrew Jackson's fighting them. In fact, most of them did fight us. Oh, uh, they didn't cooperate a whole lot. They had no choice when they came down to it. Basically, what ends up happening is they're living just like their white neighbors. Most of them were farmers. If they were in North Georgia, Tennessee, the most famous of these tribes would be the Cherokee. Those, those that were living up in that area, and a lot of you have been up in the Smoky Mountains um, there where the Cherokee were, they lived just like their white neighbor. They farmed, they did some hunting, they raised the same animals, cows, pigs, chickens. They raised the same crops. The Cherokee, some of the Cherokee were so civilized that they even had slavery, just like their white neighbors. <laughs> Yeah, they were, they were basically the same. It wasn't like they were a whole different culture. Um, and you see here in the part that I have, this is Sequoia. He was told that he was a leader of the Cherokee, and he was told, well, y'all are civilized. So um, and there he made a written language, which is and actually, if you look at the language, it's actually easier than English because where we like have different vowels that have different sounds, he made it where each, each sound had a different one. So in some ways, it made more sense than the English language. Um, they said, well, you don't have a government structure. He made a constitution, and they made a government in the Cherokee Nation, which co was copied after the U.S. Constitution, but we still have it there. But our five tribes are the Cherokee, Chickasaw, Choctaw, Creek, and the one is, that isn't there, and is, um, that doesn't start with a C, is the Seminole. These are the five civilized tribes. They're all in the southeast United States. And these are the ones that, again, they're going to lose their, their land. Now, the leader of the Cherokee, the, the name Sequoia, yes, the same as the tree. Uh, for those of you trivialized, well, instead of having a native name, since they want to civilize, he and many other Cherokees took a name, so he took an English name of George Guess, so that way it was English sounding. Uh, he creates that constitution, written language, but what ends up happening to the Cherokee? They get the trail of tears. And this is where this would repeat over and over again, these different Indian tribes where they were sent out west. What the army did is they came into where the Cherokee were. They were told on such and such date, we're coming to your, to your property, and then we will help you move. Basically, take whatever you can carry. Don't worry about bringing your cows, chickens, anything like that. Arrived to, to the area, and the army forced them out of their house. They set their house on fire, set their fields on fire. They killed all their livestock. Why are they killing livestock, setting their house and everything on fire? So they don't come back. Yeah, so they don't come back. A waste of life. Uh, and this is where they were forced to go, and a lot of things that we promised them all along the way weren't upheld. Um, and this is where a lot of contracts that were given in there, because again, they told them, don't worry about bringing all stuff. When it gets cold, we have blankets for you. And this is where one of the famous things is for other uh, stories is the fact that some of the blankets that were given to the Indians were ones that had smallpox in it. See, well, what happened is, if you had a contract, if I'm a company and my contract is to supply, supply the natives with, with blankets, well, hey, I can get these blankets real cheap from this hospital to get rid of all the stuff from smallpox. They didn't say that I have to give them good blankets. 
And then people complain when, well, the Native Americans are given blankets with smallpox. No, there wasn't a complaint about it. When they were crossing the Mississippi River and they're put on rafts, well, the rafts can only hold 30 people. Well, let's put 90 people on that raft. <laughs> and guess what happened to some of those rafts? Yeah, they overturned, and a lot of, the, a lot of them died. Was there an uproar about it? No. no. And that's where you, what you have to realize, and where we kind of point to Andrew Jackson with this, it's not just Jackson. This was the American people. They supported it. All right? Kind of looked the other way. All right? Because guess what happened to all that land that they had? Yeah, well, they could get that land. And they were seen as equals. So, tomorrow we'll start with some local history with this. And then let's say the Seminoles, well, they didn't quite play the same way as the Cherokee, because once they found out what happened to the Cherokee, all right, they were going to do the same. All right, so go ahead and put away your notes. For the, it's four. For the, um, the Cherokees when they were sent over. Here in Florida, though, they, they had heard about some of the things that had happened, and we ended up with a little bit different in what officially we call the Second Seminole War. You might remember the First Seminole War was when Andrew Jackson, he didn't kill enough Creeks in during the War of 1812, and he came down to Florida to go after those runaways, Seminole meaning run, runaway, um, there. And so after a little while, he got tired of it, and it, the First Civil War just kind of ended. There was no winner or loser. The Second Civil War, though, starts outside of Fort King. Anyone know where Fort King is? It's by no. Osceola. It's not in Osceola, not in Osceola County. Some of you have been within 50 feet of the spot where this happened. Fort Cooper? No, not Fort Cooper. Fort King is located Ocala. in Ocala on the shores where today is Silver Springs. If you've ever been to Silver Springs Park, mm -hmm. right there overlooking the springs, there's actually a statue, and there's a statue of Osceola who was stabbing the treaty that was to send, to send the Seminoles. Basically, they were signing away, going to sign away their land, and Osceola, who wasn't even a chief of the Seminoles, uh, that there, uh, but Osceola went and he went up to where the treaty was and stabbed it. Then that night the war really began because as a group of soldiers came into Fort King, they were killed. The soldiers were killed. Yeah, not a whole lot of Seminoles were killed in the Second Seminole War. A lot of American soldiers were killed. Uh, great example of this would be Day, the Day Battle, which Day Battlefield is not very far from here. We are to go about, oh, probably about 45 minutes, well some of you about 20 minutes away, right? So, but about 45 minutes away from here, outside of Bushnell, um, is where the day battlefield was. And at this time, this is where the Major Day and, uh, and 110 of his soldiers were going from Fort King down to Fort Brooke, which was in Tampa. And as they were traveling in this direction, the Seminoles had an ambush for them and killed 108 of the 110 soldiers. Oh, it's not too bad. <laughs> All right. A pretty good victory. Um, what happened to the other two? The other two were wounded and they, and they <laughs> were able to finally get back and tell what had happened. So sometimes you even leave some people alive yes. to tell what happened. Yes. And although that would be the most dramatic of all these battles, this is what would happen time and time again. Now, where is Fort Cooper? Here in Inverness. Anyone know what the story is for some place that is as a bird flies what, about three miles away from here? Uh, as again, soldiers were traveling from Fort King to Fort Brooke. They were ambushed. Um, a lot of them were ambushed. I'm not sure if it was at this time. They were tr crossing the Wipicucci River. They kind of look ahead and see, oh, okay, everything's safe. They get out in the middle of the river and suddenly they would have shots fired on them from all sides. Uh, the Seminoles were not going out to the open field and fighting. Right? They were doing guerrilla warfare. They had better weapons than the army had. <laughs> the, they weren't British. Well, it wasn't. It was almost because of the British, but they also had. They had basically Kentucky rifles. They had hunting rifles. Meanwhile, the army had those muskets. Eli Whitney interchangeable parts. Yes, you can produce more, but are they as high in quality? So the Seminoles had better weapons that could shoot further, shoot straighter, and they were able to hide in a new la landscape. Yes, the one weapon that this, the army had was a cannon. 
because it can do you much good if you're out in the middle of the woods, especially if you're in a bunch of swamps. So it doesn't do any good dragging cannons around and through a whole bunch of mud on there. So it was the wrong type of war for that. But at Fort Cooper, what happened there is that some of the soldiers that were ambushed, they had a bunch of wounded, they settled, they went right on the, the edge of the lake there. They quickly cut down some trees, cleared out an area, and just built a stockade and were waiting for reinforcements to come. And the Sentinels kind of made fun of them. They actually, if you're ever out there, were across the lake. They were yelling to them at night. They were mooning them. Uh, and what they would do is they would, and they knew how far the muskets could fire. So every time that the soldiers thought they might be there, they'd get so mad at what the Sentinels were doing. They kept them up all night uh, there. And they would fire, and then the musket ball couldn't reach there. Meanwhile, if they exposed themselves sometimes uh, there, the Sentinels had rifles that could reach them. Uh, and and so that's that's where Fort Cooper wasn't a major battle at all. Basically, it was we, they're trying to protect the wounded uh, that they had. But time and time again, the army was defeated by the Seminoles. They would go after them, and they decided one one of the things. And I have on um, have the question in there. Well, first before we get how they would win, but part of what they would do is they would hide out in the swamps. If you look, and here's where a map of Florida is. Where we are in Inverness, you have this great area. A lot of this is in what you say for us. But all of this area here, and any of you that have ever like tried to drive to Lakeland, you'll notice there's not a, a good straight shot from here to Lakeland. Same thing's true with Orlando. You have to go in and then down. We have a giant swamp called the Green Swamp, and it used to be bigger than what it is today. We've drained off a lot of it. It is the source for the Withlacoochee River. It is the source for, when you go further down, the Peace River. All right, Peace River flows in this direction, with Peace River this way. The Hillsborough River going to Tampa, all of that initiates in the Great Swamp. Well, in the Great Swamp, it's not truly one giant swamp, but it's a swampy area and you have islands and all that are in it. But what the Seminoles did is they lived on those islands. And the islands might be a couple square miles. They farmed on those islands. But the thing is, is in order to get there, you had to go through swampy areas. The Seminoles know the best path. Yeah. Yeah. Meanwhile, the army was didn't know very well. Plus, can you guess what they made the army uniforms out of? Yeah, wool. How would y'all like to be wearing a wool uniform in the middle of summer here? Yeah. There is no air conditioning. <laughs> All right, do you want to be wandering around through swamps to wear a wool uniform? That is unique. So part of what they ended up doing is for the U.S. Army, they decided, well, they'd only fight the war in the winter. So, so it's not cold, but it's a lot cooler, and the wool uniforms actually will feel, will feel pretty good. Plus the swamps, we are dry seasons the winter, so the swamps are lower. It's easy to get, easier to get around. But what happened was is the Seminoles could live during the summer safely in the green swamp on those islands. They could farm on them. And if the army ever came, they could basically, they, by the time the army got there, they'd come and they'd find a camp that had basically Seminoles have all left. They'd take an area you think they need a value, and they're just chasing them around. And it's almost like you're chasing a ghost. And that went on for several years. We had general after general that was sent down. And then what the what symbols would do is when you send an army in, they would set up an ambush and kill off a, a, a group of them. Ultimately though, how would the army, and I say how would they, how would the US Army win? How would they do it? They would burn all their stuff, burn down the Burn down the village. Well, it's hard to nuke them. They captured Osceola, and how did they capture Osceola? And several other leaders, like Wildcat and several others. Oh, they they brought in the they betrayed them. They, they yeah, they betrayed them. They, they, the U.S. Army had a flag of truce, a white flag, wow. to negotiate a treaty. Wow. Now, the <laughs> rules of war are you supposed to capture an enemy if you do a white flag. Yeah. No. Did the U.S. Army respect the Seminole tribe, or any Indian tribe, to respect the rules of war when it came to fighting them? So for Osceola, who again was the leader of them, they would end up under a white flag capturing him. Um, it was the second, the first time that they captured him actually wasn't under a white flag, and he escaped. He starved himself and went through the bars. I mean, he was um, that that he had. I mean, they were. I mean, it was things that seemed impossible, but he escaped from it when um, early. 
Ott, this time when they capture him, make sure he did escape that when he was sent to Fort Moultrie, which is in an island in Charleston, South Carolina, where he ultimately would die with his two wives. Yes, the Seminoles had polygamy. Um, but he would die then with his two wives um, at that time. Some would say of a broken heart, but it was actually, I can't remember the disease. It was basically a stomach virus that he truly would die of. But this is where people say that his heart was stolen from him. There. Um, and ultimately what the U.S. Army would do is after that, and this is where you're going to recognize this name, a guy by the name, a general by the name of Zachary Taylor. Later on would be our president. He becomes famous in the Mexican War. But Zachary Taylor would be the one that would actually go after the Seminoles, and he would just try to capture, even if he only captured four or five, they captured those small ones, and they sent them to Oklahoma. And they just, small groups, and kept pushing them further and further and further south until basically they got down to the Everglades. And then, thought the Green Swamp was hard to get. Yeah, the Everglades was really hard for yeah. them to, to get into. Um, there and what ultimately ended up happening is it, we were down to just a couple hundred Seminoles that were left, and they just basically the U.S. Army said, "Well, forget it. They can if they want to live way down in the Everglades, that's useless land. We'll let them have it." But one of the things here is that the Seminoles in all three of the Seminole Wars never surrendered, which is why yes, their Creek name means runaway, but what did the Seminoles call themselves? Warrior. As you see in front of Florida State Stadium, unconquered, because they never surrendered. Um, um, in all the Indian wars that the U.S. Army had against all Indian tribes during the entire history, the Seminole War was the costliest both in money and in lives. Uh, and the Seminole, again, the Seminoles never, they didn't win it, but they never surrendered. Uh, the Third Seminole War was actually not much of a war. What happened in Fort, Fort Pierce over on the East Coast? Um, a, a person had claimed that they, that they had been attacked by some Seminoles. It wasn't. They just made up the story. And so they went over into the edge of the Everglades where the Seminoles had been living for a couple decades and just started shoot, shooting the Seminoles at that time. And Seminoles defended themselves. And it just kind of, for a couple of weeks, they were shooting them with each, each group. And it wasn't much of a war. But that's what the third Seminole War was. The second Seminole War, though, was the big one they had had. Um, Again, a lot of story with this, but this is where he kind of goes into things with our local history as well as the Indian Removal Acts. Did the Seminoles want to have happen to them what happened to Cherokee on the Trail of Tears? And they would rather fight for what the, what they what they believe. Now, to kind of go ahead in history, time and time again, Indian tribes have said that their land was stolen from them. It was. Yeah, it was. Except for when they would sue the U.S. government for the land that was stolen from them, the U.S. government could pull out a treaty from 18-something and say, look, here, there's an X on this where your chief gave us this land for 18 mirrors. They probably didn't have much choice. The Seminole Indians sued the U.S. government back in the 60s, 70s. Could they pull out a treaty from the Seminole surrendering? No, they couldn't. And so they were an Indian tribe that actually won that lawsuit, and they worked out a settlement. Because the very last treaty that was ever signed by the Seminoles gave them all of the land basically south of Gainesville, Florida, down once you got 20 miles inland. So Inverness actually technically would have belonged to the Seminole Indian tribe. Now, they knew that that wasn't going to be feasible that in the 1970s that they give them all that land. But they worked out a settlement with them. The Seminole Indian tribe then got millions of dollars. Instead of going with the small number of symbols there were, dividing the money up, they made it as a business and a trust. And they have, like, they have an out, they have an alligator farm, they have ranches, they have orange groves, they have businesses on and down in South America. Uh, and if you are a Seminole, you are able to get a dividend check at, from those businesses every month um, that you have. I don't know what it is now. About 10 years ago, it was, I think, $1,400 a month that you got if you were a Seminole Indian. It's a lot more now because part of their business they've gone to in the last 10 years is casinos. And I will tell you, as I went through a, a reservation two years ago, I remember when I was younger going through, through a reservation, and it was pretty much shacks there. They were nice homes, all right, with these big old nice trucks in front of it. Um, and, there, where the Miccosukee Casino down at, down near Miami has made a lot of money. 
um, there, but for the Seminoles. But they use, but again, instead of just handing out the money, that's what they did. Um, since all, like, there was all of the Cherokees from that area? No, some of the Cherokee hid in the mountain. That's why if you go to North Carolina, there's still a small number of um, Right, and some, some, some came back later on, but there were some that hid out. This, basically the same thing the Seminoles did, except they went high into the mountains. In the areas that basically people set up, well, you can't farm up there anyways. So it's, and it couldn't round up everyone. All right, now we'll get back to, again, this, that's more local history out <laughs> there, but you should know when you're driving. Like if you, if you draw, if you draw that period, that area that I told you that they set up the ambush, um, if you are driving to Ocala on Highway 200, it is within a mile of there where crackers, not crackers, um, what's the restaurant? Stump knockers. We're stump knockers on the river. It's right there on 200. That's where basically they, they set up a trap, Osceola, and they killed a bunch of the U.S. soldiers as they were trying to cross the river in that area. Uh, there. Um, all right, call it the age of Jackson, but we could call it the age of Clay. Henry Clay would promote his American system. There are three parts you need to know, and there's actually more to it than this, but I'm again trying to keep it simple. The first part is the protective tariffs. Now, a tariff is what? A tax, is that an import? tax on imports. Yeah, tax on imports. So, besides being taxpayer money, what else? Why else would you have a protective tariff? So you protect local your business market. economy. Local business. You protect yours. And here's where I think I had this before in another part of the notes. If let's say you had some cloth that cost four dollars to make in Europe, you put a twenty-five percent tariff, so it costs five dollars a roll. Well, they're going to have to sell for five dollars a roll. But the American, if it costs four dollars, then the American will be cheaper. So you're going to have people buy more American products. That's good for our businesses, but as a consumer, you don't have as much choice. You might even have to pay more for it. So that is one thing that Henry Clay wanted. Let's see. Alexander Hamilton would he have liked the idea of a protective tariff? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. okay. Very much so. Second thing Henry Clay <laughs> fought for was the Bank of the U.S. to continue it on. Would Alexander Hamilton like the Bank of the U.S.? Yes. Okay. So, and what the money policy would have? Internal improvements. Yeah, yeah. What are internal improvements? Roads, roads canals. Roads, uh, canals. Later on, you could add into it the railroads, steamboats. Now, Alexander Hamilton didn't push for that, but would that help businesses? Yes. Yes, so taxpayer money, government spending things on roads and canals, he would have liked that. Um, another thing that actually, and I don't have it on this, that, uh, that things that Henry Clay pushed for with the American system was things with education. He was one saying, if we have a more educated public, is it going to help our business? Okay, we have that right now. Our governor today, Governor Scott, one of the things that he's pushing for is for what is called STEM. All right, science, technology type classes. If you if you go into a major with that, you might end up, if you are taking math and science classes, you might have, have lower tuition than if you're taking English and philosophy and classes like that because we need to have more people in math and science, which will help our industry in Florida as well as the United States. Um, so that's part of what then you would have. Uh, for them. And again, this is where systems of roads that, that are being built, the turnpikes that, that we have. But Henry Clay, even though we, we don't have a true Whig leader, he is the Whig leader. When we get to Andrew Jackson, you're going to find he's actually pretty easy to remember with this time period. Because we have a couple major things. We have the Indian crisis. We have the second party system with the Whigs and the Democrats. Here's the third thing with the nullification crisis. In 1828, we would have the tariff of abomination or abominations that was passed. It was one that sometimes when you have a bill, everybody puts their own two cents in it. And when everything was said and done, almost everybody didn't like it. Very few, even people up north didn't like it. Um, because what some of the things that they needed actually got, got attacked. So people didn't really like it. John C. Calhoun, who remember he had resigned as vice president, he he suggests, when South Carolina really didn't like it, he suggests nullification. Now, what is nullification? Making a law void, like a candidate doesn't matter anymore. Yeah, you say it's void. So he's saying, we in South Carolina don't like it, we're not going to obey it. Where would he get an idea like that? Yeah. 
Yeah, the Virginia, Kentucky resolutions and Jefferson and Madison. It just wasn't that he came and, and started with this idea. You know, it's John C. Calhoun, where plague pops up. Well, here's John C. Calhoun. Well, four years later, we have another tariff. We have a compromise tariff. <coughs> uh, who's Mr. Compromiser? Henry Clay. He makes this compromise tariff. Most of the people in the North like this, but the Southerners, which don't, doesn't have the industry, they don't like this tariff. They end up having what is called the South Carolina Exposition. And put a star by this, don't get confused with the Civil War. This is not when they're breaking away from the Civil War. Here's when they go and South Carolina meets, led by John C. Calhoun, and they say they're not going to obey this law. All right, let's look at the story. We have John C. Calhoun, Jackson's former vice president, who resigned during the Peggy Eaton affair. He's leading people in South Carolina saying they won't obey a federal law. How do you think Jackson, who is supposed to enforce this law, likes the idea of Calhoun and people in South Carolina telling him, we're not going to do what you tell us to do? Jackson, he, does he take kindly to criticism? And he ends up pushing through Congress what was called the Force Act. Now remember we had a Force Act with the embargo of 1807. Basically when you see anything for a Force Act, it's called basically the thing enforcement. Now how could Jackson enforce this act? The Army. Now, if you're South Carolina and you have Andrew Jackson, who has now been given permission by Congress to go down to South Carolina and force them to, do you think he might use the military and go into the city of Charleston and knock down a few buildings and knock a few heads around? So do you want to decide to test Jackson on this policy? So South Carolina ultimately says they will pay the tariff. But here's what's kind of funny with things. They nullify the Force Act. They say that's an illegal act. We're not going to obey the Force Act. If they pay the tariff, does the Force Act even matter? No. So South Carolina does it. So basically, they, they talk a good game, but they're not actually doing anything with that. But ultimately, who wins the nullification crisis? Yeah, Andrew Jackson. Um, but. Here's where we kind of get to, though, you know, South Carolina, this idea, if you don't like something the federal government's doing, you don't have to obey it. So these seeds that have been planted, Virginia, Kentucky Resolution, Hartford Convention, they're building up. Yeah. Do you think a lot of these first presidents would be re-elected today? It would be interesting to see. Uh, for one thing, for one thing, Jackson probably wouldn't, and this is where 24-hour news, I mean, you think about when people are running today, and you say one thing, and it's played over and over and over again. So, I mean, this is, <laughs> this is kind of possible. And this is one thing that we have today. We probably don't have our best leaders run for office, because would you want to go through that? Would you want to put your family through that? So, some of our very best leaders, they're not going to. Uh, realistically, if you're running for president, you, won't, you better have a big ego because that's why you're going to. Um, um, so, and again, it's a different world today. All right, we have the Indian crisis, we have the second party system, we have the nullification crisis, the bank war. Here's the other big thing for Jackson's time period. Jackson did not like the idea of the bus. Why? Do you have power to the government? Well, part of that, the government, he, he thought it was too much power, especially the federal government. Should should one group of rich rich men control the money of a country? And Jackson doesn't. Remember, he is a person fighting for democracy and the common man. Well, the bank isn't for the common man, he felt like it. But there was a personal reason, too. That panic of 1819, remember kind of the key words to remember it were wildcat banks? Guess who lost a lot of money in the panic of 1819? Jackson. Yeah, Jackson. 
Because he was one of those people holding the papers last. Now, is he going to blame the fact that maybe he was too speculative in his investments and he happened to be caught with that? Or is he going to blame the banks? So those rich people, they're the ones that, that did them. So he doesn't like this idea of the bigger banks. Guess what Henry Clay's involved in this? Believe it or not. Compromise. No, it's not compromising this time. Actually, Henry Clay sees an opportunity. Oh, here we go. Jackson doesn't like the bank. It was supposed to be rechartered in 1836. But Henry Clay decides, let me push it up four years and make it a campaign issue. And he thought there is no way Jackson would ever veto the bank bill. So Henry Clay gets a push through Congress. It's passed to recharter the Bank of the United States, what would then end up being the third bank. Because no way in election year will Jackson veto it. And guess what Jackson does? He vetoed it. Yeah, he vetoes it. <laughs> Don't challenge Jackson. But that means the bank's still going to be alive for four years, possibly get rechartered sometime there. Yeah. Does Jackson want it to live? No. How do you kill a bank? That's got only has four years left. Keep burning. No, I don't burn. Take the money. You take the money out. And he put them in what were called pet banks. He put them in smaller state banks there. Meanwhile, the president of the bank, and you should recognize the, the name of Nicholas Biddle. Biddle, he's fighting Jackson trying to keep the bank alive. So Biddle's kind of working along with Henry Clay, and Jackson is taking chunks of money and putting them in the, the bank. So Biddle is, is fighting for something that is disappearing underneath his feet. And Jackson ends up killing the Bank of the United States before that four years is over. So who wins the bank war? Jackson. Yeah, Jackson. He's a pretty powerful guy. Yeah. And he was against the paper. So. All right, Henry Clay versus Jackson. Here's where we kind of cut, kind of summarize a few things in here. Remember, one of the things the American system had was internal improvements, especially turnpikes and now. There was the Maysville Road. There was a bill that was, that was passed in Congress, and it came to Jackson, and Jackson vetoed it. This, this would make a road that went through Kentucky. It would con con connect a whole bunch of towns and industries in Kentucky. It was something that would actually be really good for the state of Kentucky. Now, where's Henry Clay from? Kentucky. Does Henry Clay really want this for his own state? Yeah. Not just for his plan for America. And here is where Jackson vetoes it. Now, officially, the reason why he vetoes it is, he says, if it's only in one state, why should all the other states pay for it? He said, if it was an interstate going to a war, then, okay, well, I, I wouldn't veto it. But unofficially, why did he veto it? He doesn't like Henry Clay. Yeah, he doesn't like Henry Clay. Okay, he knew Henry Clay wanted this, he could do it, he found his reason to do it. 1832, Jackson runs against Henry Clay. And what happens when Henry Clay runs for president? He loses. Yeah. If you see this, is Jackson a popular president? That's weird. So, seems like all play. the seems like all the politicians don't like him. All the people do. Right, the people like Andrew Jackson. Again, he is even though he's a rich man, he's fighting for the common person. He runs on that campaign. He follows up on it. All right, this is one of the boring things, but it kind of and it doesn't fit perfectly into any of these, but fits into all of this. We would have this debate lasting over a period of time. Webster, who's Webster that you should remember from this time period? He wrote this spelling. Uh, not Noah Webster. Oh. Daniel Webster. Okay. What area? Oh, he's, he's, he's from the west. No. no, the north. Yeah, the north, New England area. He's the third guy. We have Calhoun Clay, and then he's not as not as well known and um, publicized, but he's fighting for things in there. And then we have another senator, that Hayne, that is kind of fighting, and the idea that they're debating over different issues. They're debating over the bank. Should there be a federal government having it? Should this be with the states? The nullification, the tr tariffs. Realistically, this is over state versus federal powers. 
In all actuality, they're continuing the debate that Jefferson and, and Hamilton had had. And in all actuality, are we still having that debate today? Should health care be done by the federal government or should it be done by states? And so we're still having that debate on how much power should the federal government have. Um, Calhoun and Jackson, not really liking each other a whole lot. Two hot-headed guys. I mean, how, and Calhoun's just almost as hot-headed as Jackson is. Um, but they have to be sometimes together in public. And there is a time that that what they do and they have some toast to get toast on things and and basically Jackson does a toast to the to the United States and, the, and to the federal government which Calhoun and basically he's doing this basically doing a jab at Calhoun who's further down the table and there Calhoun stands up and gives a toast to liberty and freedom basically saying the federal government is and so they both have their little even though they want to go out and shoot each other they can't really do that as president and um, and there, no, they can't duel. It actually is illegal in most places um, there. But and as president, you, know, you can't really do it. Jackson used to. He isn't at this time. Um, again, it's kind of odd, but Jackson ran, and one of the things he wanted was to decrease federal power, and he increased it while he was there. All right, a couple financial things. Second coin to Jack. Here's where you're going to see this come up again and again in here. Should we use silver? Bimetallism will be the word later on. Remember across the gold speech that we had for, for with your bracketing dates? And what we did up doing, we would we would make it for a while there that you could use silver. And we made a ratio that there was for every ounce of gold, you would have to have 16 ounces of silver. So we tied the, the, the price of silver with the price of gold. So as gold went up, so the silver and vice versa. Here's something that you all, it did happen in your lifetime, and hopefully it'll happen again in your lifetime. We had a surplus. Now you all are used to the word deficit. <laughs> deficit means you are spending more than you bring in. Back when you all were really young, in the late 1990s, for a couple of years, we had a surplus in the United States where we actually brought in more tax money, because it's not a fairy tale. Okay. But we, we, we actually brought in more tax money than we spent. But then we had tax cuts, we had wars, we spent on all kinds of other things in there. So we now spend over a trillion dollars a year more for a government than we bring in. Don't worry about it. The workers of tomorrow will pay for it. Oh, that's you. <laughs> okay, but that's where. Don't worry, you'll take care of the Social Security and Medicare crisis also. Yeah, it's one field All right, but love takes. those baby boomers. Okay, you made their, you're going to make their life good because they'll be long gone and you're going to pay their debts um, that they have. Don't worry, I'll pay pump some of it, but I'm taking as much with me as I can. Uh, but we not only had a surplus, but the only year in the history of the United States, we actually got rid of the national debt. <coughs> 1837, okay? 1837, we actually had no national debt for a very, very short time. What did they have to argue about? <laughs> well, actually, here's when they had a surplus. Jackson says, lower taxes. What does Henry Clay want to do with that extra money? Spend it on what? Internal improvements. Internal improvements. Okay. Education. All right, let's, let's do things to get the country better for the future. And, is there, and Jackson's idea, and you kind of look at things, it's kind of the argument that we have today. Except for they were doing it with extra money. They weren't doing it on borrowing money from someplace else. They weren't arguing over how to spend borrowing. They're arguing over, well, should we cut taxes on there? And where it's the government, we were going to make it smaller, keep it the same, or should we not? But we didn't have to worry about it very long. Oh, before we get to, to one thing in there, we would also have a bill pushed through by Jackson. Remember, he didn't like what happened with the Wildcat Banks. He pushed through a bill, and Congress passed it, called Specie Circular. For those of you have, specie means coins or money. You see, we're circular. Yeah. And what Specie Circular was, the only way you could buy land, and there are a few other things, but mainly land was gold and silver. No paper money. Remember that one day when I had to think about paper money? All right. Something concrete that you would have. 
it sounds real good, but it actually would go, and for a lot of loans and paper money, it made it where there was a financial crisis. Thus, we have the Panic of 1837. And it would actually end up lasting for five years. Guess what was the last year of Jackson's presidency? 1837. He leaves office in March of 1837. Realistically, the Panic of 1837 was Jackson's fault. Does he get blamed for it? No, Harry Clay. Well, not Harry Clay. Who's the next president? Wait. Martin Van Ruin. Is Martin Van Ruin the economy? So the, his vice president takes over and he gets blamed for Jackson's. Because can we blame Jackson for something? No, no, no. Jackson's a great guy. He's fighting for a common man. All right? It's Van Buren's fault. A lot of yeah, oh, right. what, what, why did the painting of 1837 start? Realistically, we made a financial crisis with species circular. Okay. It was something that, and you'll find economic crisis after economic crisis happened in part because of banks. Our last great recession that we had happened because banks over-speculated and we had our land boom. Actually, if you look at things, same thing that was 1819, okay, 1819, we had the same thing happen in 2007. All right, that's the end for